This is Captain Yardbird. I wanted to share with you guys some thoughts I've been tumbling about for some time now. Free will is a concept our species has been struggling with since we could. And basically I'm going to ramble about a couple of areas that limit our free will by predisposing us towards certain behavior. The areas I will focus on are sexual biology, neurology, and socioeconomic environment. From there, I will segue into the concept of tribal leadership as laid out in a book by the same name, and how we use that to better our social environment. With that said, I will tackle a couple of definitions. I believe that confirmation bias is the greatest scourge on humanity. Don't bother me with the details. Fuck you and fuck your facts. Most people seem to go through life more or less on autopilot. They have a conceptual framework in their heads governing how they believe reality to be. So while on autopilot, one never gives this area much thought. Uh, they don't question their own perspective. So when presented with observable evidence, pieces of reality, that disagree with our perspective, we tend to dismiss these. When they become persistent, we tend to respond with hostility. We may even play an active role in suppressing these subjects among our, our peer group. We respond this way because we're attached to our perspective emotionally. It factors into our identity as individuals. So when presented with evidence against that perspective, we take it as a personal attack against our very being. So I'd like to present some further reading to you, which I will do often in this presentation. Links will be in the description. A transcript will be on my blog spot. Stardusk, the thinking ape, posted a vid in recent history called Say No to Pie in the Sky. He, like most of the YouTube channels I will cite today, is one of my favorite content creators. Vernaculus also put up one uh, about the same time called Hashtag New Cult Values. I've been very impressed with this young man. He's well on the path of evidentialism. Speaking of which, a channel which has been inactive for some years, Evidence, did a series which I would like to point Vernaculus to. Why I Am No Longer a Christian is the series title. It ends on the conclusion, the thesis of evidentialism, even going into the epistemology of it. So if you like the nuts and bolts of such things, please go check it out. Next, I would like to give a broad definition to red pill. For me, a red pill is any piece of reality which most find, at the very least, discomforting. The red pill is about pursuit of understanding of the dark places most of humanity seems to choose to ignore. Consequently, there's a certain loneliness about it. One of the most important red pills I took was when I dove into the understanding of Cluster B personality disorders. I dug into that mess long before looking into the red pill of gender relations. I did so largely out of self-preservation, as along my life's journey I have kept company with a few truly predatory personalities of quite different backgrounds. But on to the meat of this. Humanity, like the rest of nature, is neither inherently good or bad. Uh, an individual is really shaped by a number of different areas that create, mitigate, or, or bolster a variety of predisposed behaviors. Firstly, members of the MGTOW community have done some excellent work in describing the gynocentrism inherent to our species. It is argued that we value women over men due to our sexual dimorphism and the evolutionary process. Here I'd like to point you to Coltane's video, MGTOW, A Unified Theory of the Human Condition. Go check it out. 
I could not do it justice here in simply trying to summarize. I'd also like to bring up an article from The Economist of February 7th, 2015, titled CADs and Dads. The article discusses the finding that uh, promiscuity and fidelity as uh, competing reproductive strategies are equally prevalent to each other and across both genders. That is, women and men cheat in roughly equal measure. It is likely that a man may raise the child of another, uh, even unawares. Next, I find highly important the subject of neurology. Shaped by our genetics and life experience, childhood, lifestyle, diet, abuse, trauma, drugs, your neurochemical climate in your head predisposes you to various behaviors as well. For example, I personally have Asperger's syndrome, and there are many areas of social finesse which I just stumble my way through handicapped. Though I have learned how not to take uh, miscommunications arising from this personally, I take much care to express myself precisely and uh, periodically overdo it a little bit. So, back to red pills and cluster B personalities. A gross percentage of the cluster are socially predatory creatures. I find their existence blows massive holes in many ideologies out there. Any in-group you can come up with, regardless of the creed, ethnicity, race, anything else, status as trans or other kin, whatever the fuck, any such in-group will have a percentage of cluster B predators. I would imagine that the victim economy is largely dominated by such individuals. They're equally at home as preachers as they are as pimps. I believe Mark Twain said, Religion is the last refuge of the scoundrel. So this area of psychology by itself really nullifies in-group preference, shows it to be a farce, a maladaptive behavior to be scrapped. The idea that if you identify with my chosen demographic, then well, you're the good guy and someone else outside of the group, well, he is simply not. These interpersonal predators are always the bad guy and they are in every demographic. They are in every in-group. I find that strict voluntarist libertarianism, uh, intersectional feminism and social justice, and neoconservatism are but a few of the ideologies, what I like to call postmodern religions, which are equally guilty of confirmation bias and equally guilty of ignoring the impact of Cluster B personalities on their various in-groups. For further reading, The Sociopath Next Door by Martha Stout is a fantastic introduction to this topic. I would also point you towards uh, Katie Morton's channel for general psychology information. She is a licensed therapist and an active YouTuber. Uh, Spetsnaz is another channel focused more specifically on the issues of abuse, trauma, and isolation from the male perspective in Western culture. So now I'd like to move on to environment. I think our behavior, how we treat each other, is ridiculously subject to the environment we find ourselves in. To illustrate racism. The dictionary, rather than the intersectional definition, really breeds strongest in poverty. When you have a population that is unable to produce self-reliance and subsistence, uh, squalor creates shitty people. We treat each other like shit when we have nothing better to do. So when you grow up around shitty people and you are exposed to 
multiple demographics, other ethnicities, religions, and whatnot. When your life experience of people in these other groups is limited to the worst, it is very easy to come to the conclusion that all members of that group must be shit. This is essentially where racism stems from. Affluence, cultural assimilation, cross-pollination. These are the things that really break down and destroy racism and related prejudice, albeit in a slow process. And here I would point you to the Angry Foreigners video, uh, Immigrant Rape Statistics in Sweden. On misogynist cultures and gynocentrism, in the apocalyptic landscape, in societal collapse, places such as the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, in cultures such as this, gynocentrism rears its head in a strange way in that, among such people, men are disposable tools for your in-group or uh, their threats to it from the outside. Your in-group has soldiers, working stiffs, human doings in its men, and valuable property in its women as uh, reproductive vessels. Such an arrangement serves the continuation of the species in such a harsh environment. Uh, gynocentrism. As Coltane's video describes it, and as C.S. MGTOW's video, Gender in Post-Government Societies, illustrates, is made for such a landscape. A collapse mimics the Iron Age and the Neolithic. This is the old stomping ground of gynocentrism. In truly hunter-gatherer societies, war and murder are rampant. In the Economist article, Noble or Savage, I quote, Usually around 25 to 30 percent of adult males die from homicide. It goes on, Not so many women as men die in warfare, because they are often the object of the fighting. Now that I've brought you to that dark place, I want to relate to you a concept that describes who our species manipulates and betters our social, political, and economic environment. Tribal Leadership by Dave Logan, John King, and Haley Fisher Wright describes a series of stages of tribal culture, each characterized by the language we use and the interpersonal relationships we build within each stage. Here, I will point you to two TEDx talks by Dave Logan in the low bar. I hope you will find them intoxicating. Individually, we are members of multiple tribes, each with its own culture, sometimes uh, multiple stages of culture. So we are always engaging across these different stages. Okay. Tribe is defined as a group of people numbering 20 to 150. The members of your tribe are people in your phone, people you stop and say hello to on the street. The tribes you are part of form through familial ties, the workplace, and increasingly the internet. The five stages, again, are defined by their language and their behavior. Stage one is summed up in the phrase, life sucks. People experiencing this stage are alienated from others. Tribes in this stage respond to the world with despairing hostility. This is the culture of prison gangs and societal collapse. The book estimates that some 2% of American professionals operate here. Stage 2 declares, my life sucks. The member recognizes that others' lives don't suck. These are apathetic victims who engage in very cynical humor. 
They are hourly associates at Walmart. They are characters in office space. Some 25% of American professionals experience their work this way. Stage 3 says, I'm great, with the background whisper, and you're not. 49% of workplace professionals operate in this stage. Members are overcompetitive, expressing their pride through a veal of humor and always striving for dominance. They form dyadic relationships, that is, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, controlling information as if they were the center of a wheel and their peers the spokes. In stage three, one feels that they can't depend on any of their peers to execute tasks correctly. Stage four is characterized as we're great. 22% of American professionals are members of such tribes. Uh, they take on further characteristics, uh, including holding dear to the tribe's identity, core values, and a noble cause, which I'll explore later some more in, in this vid. Uh, stage five states that life is great. It operates similarly to stage four, but it has no enemy in competitor tribes. This stage is typically short-lived as it seems to require a universally valuable work or task which would benefit mankind. So now that that summary is out of the way, I want to point out that it is very harmful to label someone as stage two or three or whatever, to label them as a given stage. Uh, this is counterproductive. We all experience different stages at different times. We move up and down, progress and digress. The best way to help someone better themselves through this lens is to teach them the concept in whole. Give them the fucking book. So let me discuss the dynamic between stage two and stage three tribes. The relationship between the two is one of inherent conflict, but a definite codependency. Members of stage three tribes tend to hire underlings who exhibit stage two culture. Of course, then the stage two employee begins to say, my life sucks because my boss is a dick. I remember a time when I worked for Walmart, and whenever I asked questions, suggested we could do things better a different way, superiors would look at me like I was a fucking monkey. They were awesome. I was not, and my job was to shut up and do what they told me. I'd like to point out here that Gamergate essentially arose as a stage two culture. My life sucks because the gaming press are corrupt, stifle conversation, tell me I suck, declare that my identity is dead, etc. Fill in the blank. This is why. Gamergate had had the, the, the surging life that it did. I think it's easy to look at a lot of the internal Gamergate controversy, the infighting, as cases of individual personalities growing into stage three culture, and sometimes attempting to lift their peers with them. But the rest of the greater tribe, in their cynicism, found it easy to rebel against this. Though a shining example of stage four behavior developed out of one of these bouts of infighting, a Sargon of Akkad's hashtag Gamergate tea time stream in November of 2014, strove to mend personality clashes, which had been brewing for some time. 
The organizers reminded all involved, we shouldn't be bickering amongst ourselves. We have an enemy in common for fuck's sake. The book terms such an event an oil change. They describe it as a process for the tribe to work through three questions. What is working well? What is not working well? What can the tribe do to make those things work? The authors caution that stage two dominated tribes will voice grievances with no real desire to fix the problems. Groups at stage three will find that oil changes degenerate into, well, witch hunts. Only when the tribe is aligned on core values and a noble cause does it have a basis to assess its behavior, find shortcomings, and restore its focus on its principles. But back to questions of stages two and three. Nico Chosky is one of my absolute favorite content creators. And in his mental prison videos, and indeed many of his videos, and in his conversations with Dark Knight and Spetsnaz, he seeks to elevate men out of the squalor of stage one and really stage two, and into stage three, out of my life sucks and into I'm great, which is really the realm of self-actualization. Stage three is where you learn to master your work, your craft, your art. It's where you turn pro. Nico, as set apart from many MGTOW community channels, isn't simply focused on my life sucks. He wants his viewers to not only protect themselves from risks, but to really find themselves and to do well. I think for this, he caught enough shit that he needed a vacation. I'm very glad that he's back, with or without the label. I believe CS took a hiatus at that, about the same time, essentially for the same reason. He dares to have a greater conversation beyond, my life sucks. And not everyone's ears are open to that, unfortunately. Here I remind you of my description of confirmation bias and red pills. Now as one develops up into stage three, and really own it as Sargon and Milo Yiannopoulos have, there comes what the authors call a tribal leadership epiphany. And here a person experiences a number of internal statements and realizations which may come all at once or they may stretch out over the course of a career but they are described as follows nothing that matters is personal stage three has no legacy stage three winnings are small have i been a leader up till now or just a manipulator I'm tired of the stage three game. During this epiphany, the subject begins to see others' uh, perspectives on themselves, and they don't like what they see. They don't like how other people view them. So all of that, uh, this is how one graduates to stage four thinking. One learns to trust other and recognize their strengths. So here one learns the value of the triad. Maggie, Richard, and Bocephus are a triadic relationship. They value maintaining honesty with each other. Furthermore, each member takes a personal responsibility in helping maintain the opposite leg of the triad. That is, Bo helps ensure that Maggie and Dick's relationship remains healthy. Maggie puts the same effort into Bo and Dick's relationship. Dick is responsible for Bo and Maggie. 
This is the building block that the most effective tribes are made of. Another important hallmark of stage four and five tribes is that they have what the authors call core values and a noble cause. These things only work if they're universal. That is, the values and cause must be of benefit to all humankind in order to be core and to be noble. Dave Rubin illustrates this in the majority of his interviews where he seeks at some point to establish with his guests that they hold liberal values in common. The noble cause appears to be to better establish and ensure an environment friendly to free speech, that the societal conversation may not self-censor so that the conversation can be of the utmost quality and honesty. The stage four mentality of his show became especially obvious to me when Dave had on Kelly Carlin, and they discussed her house parties in which she essentially brokers triadic relationships with her guests. Dave Rubin also consistently identifies the regressive left as the common enemy in his interviews as they stomp on free speech so hard and vilify those who don't help shore up their chosen narrative. So I don't have a lot to say about stage five, as I have not experienced that even tangentially, though it is on my bucket list. You should read the book. I will digress for a moment on rogue tribes. The book describes these as having non-core values and an ignoble cause. That is, that the cause and values do not hold universal benefit for all humankind. I will argue that collectivist viewpoints inherently beget rogue tribes, as they would trample on the individual for the well-being of the group. Here we find intersectional feminism uh, and the other postmodern religions, conspiracy cultures, Al-Qaeda, and Hitler. Such values and causes justify criminal or at least antisocial behaviors. There's a reason the term feminazi was coined. With that, I would bid y'all good night.